technology. It's changing the world. And it's the people who can build something from scratch, something that never existed before, who will go on to change that world. But then, what happens for V2? The rewrite's always better. Who wins in that world? It's a question playing out in AI today. So that's why we're sitting down with my multi-time co-founder and friend, Brett Gibson. He runs Initialized now, alongside Jen Wolf, now that I'm back at YC. What's the future gonna look like? It won't be the same as the past, but it will rhyme. Let's get started. Brett and I worked on a startup named Posturus together with our other co-founder, Sachin Agarwal. One of the new things we did was a new kind of authentication by email header. You could post your blog where we would use your email to figure out who you were. So then you could just send email to post at posturus.com and we'd figure it out. That was the thing that had not really been done before in a consumer product and to do it, it required a different kind of engineering mindset. A big part of an engineer's day-to-day -day problem is figuring out the right tools for the job, figuring out what they should be using, and figuring out how it ties back to user value. Because, um, you know, I think that I come from this, you know, this default engineering mentality where I really want things to be precise and deterministic. And, you know, oftentimes, the engineering challenges you face to get to get the product working the way you want it for your users are much more probabilistic. Because it hadn't been done before, we had to do some pretty unusual things to get it right. You know, we ended up writing our own uh, parts of our own <laughs> SMTP client, which I don't I don't really recommend. Um, doing a lot of analysis on the routing that email went through, so that we could you know have some probabilistic score about how likely it was to actually be from you. And then the post haven experience was night and day. Posturus later sold to Twitter for $20 million, but a few years later, they decided to shut it down, since the real reason why they bought it was for the team. When it shut down, Brett and I got back together to write it again. This was called Post Haven. And this time, when we wrote it again, this post by email authentication that we had to write for the first time had been commodified. There was a product, it was Mailgun, it was ready. It, it worked off the shelf for 90% of what we needed. Had we been too grounded in fighting the last battle, we would have missed that. We would have wasted a lot of time. We would have built a lot of software that we didn't need to build. What we're seeing today in 2023 is similar to what we found rewriting Posturus again as Post Haven, even just four years later. First, it's a lot easier to rewrite once you've written it once, but second, tooling in open source and freely available APIs gets so much better in just the course of a few years. For AI, now that set of years sometimes is months or weeks. But know that this isn't a new thing. What is new is how much more powerful these capabilities in ML and large language models have become. Now everyone has this new primitive of generative AI and, and especially large language models. And they're trying to figure out exactly how to use them. And the moment is actually very strange because there's a lot of interesting tech on how to do it. You know, there's a lot of best practices around stuff like vector databases and embeddings um, so that you can get your prompts correct. But it's, it's exacerbated because large language models are fundamentally non-deterministic systems. Um, that's, you know, the, the lack of determinism is, is in part what makes them work so well and seem so magic. And so the, the class of, uh, I guess, you know, first generation hacks to get them working in ways that, that deliver value to users is, is perhaps more interesting than some of the things we've seen in the past along the same lines. This alien intelligence we have access to now, it's a strange one. And we're just in the first innings of the tooling, the foundational models, and especially the open source. It's interesting because I see a lot of parallels in what's happening in AI right now and what happened in crypto over the last few years. Because there was a moment, you know, there's so much infrastructure around wallets and building up 
um, you know, ability to, to be consumer facing in crypto that if you were building in 2018, you just had to build from scratch. And the underlying ecosystem has come a long way and you're probably having to throw away some of that custom code. And in AI, it's, it's the same thing, but perhaps even moving faster because not only do you have uh, the day-to-day -day building out of, of, the, of the types of tooling that would make your life easier, you, we have these step function improvements in the underlying foundational models that change the, the requirements. I think that the North Star is always backing it out from what, what experience you want to give to the user because um, if you make sure you get that right, uh, then you can change your technology behind the scenes. Um, but you know, trying to, try to have the trade-off of uh, how long it takes to deliver that versus competitors. That is the lesson from software engineering, and it's the same one Brett and I learned in 2008, 2013, and we're learning again today in 2023. Whether it was just some new capability in the early days of social to what's happening today in AI, first, you have to be willing to build something that doesn't exist yet and do some pretty unusual things to do it. But then, later, you need to be able to do rewrites and stay current with open source and new stacks, capabilities, and APIs, all while being connected to the needs of your customers and users. Make stuff people want. And that is what makes products sticky and what makes a durable business. Being a domain expert in tooling um, really helps, gives you a lot of leverage toward that goal, but it's not the goal in its own right. Brett's one of the best engineers I've ever had a chance to work with across our years writing code for Posturus, Y Combinator, Posthaven, and Initialized. And he's always been super pragmatic, and I've learned something new from him regularly. He's got a new podcast called The High Bit, where he sits down with some of the best technical founders to talk tech engineering and the idea maze, kind of what we just did in this episode. One of those companies was Bison Trails, which was acquired by Coinbase and post-IPO, the notional value of that acquisition was nearly a billion dollars. That's because it became Coinbase Cloud, one of the key SaaS revenue generators for Coinbase. Brett invested in Bison Trails when it was just a few people very early, when proof of stake was little more than an idea, something that did not actively run the world's largest blockchains like it does now but that's precisely how you should invest when you want to create the future. When I met Bison Trails, there was there were little or no major networks running proof of stake. And, and I still had doubts in my mind as to the viability of, of widespread shift to proof of stake networks, uh, especially for already running networks like Ethereum. Now it's very clear that it's, a, it's demonstrably possible, if not optimal in many contexts. What the Bison Trails founders recognized was that um, relative to the current proof of work mining that was happening, running validators on proof of stake networks was a novel and, and, rel and difficult problem. They were able to build something that had never been built before because of two things. First, they were generalist, focusing on a wide skill set. Here's Aaron Henshaw, co-founder of Bison Trails, on how hiring was a big piece of their success. The best thing that we did was we actually brought on like generalists at the beginning, more people who could both like write JavaScript and do Terraform. That's a really wide band between those two things, but that's what we needed at the beginning because we had JavaScript to write. We actually had like a front end, we had an API to build, so we had a middle and then we had this whole back end. You're lucky if you go far enough to be able to hire the people that you need to fix your problems that you created. For yourself and those people you know they come in wide open but they like they're so good at it they're so they're so good at these specific yeah, problem yeah. solving and like you're just like in awe that they can come in and just like change it all and make it yeah. work like 10x better second you've really got to invest into software testing so that when the chips are on the line and they always are in crypto custody and staking you have the right engineering infra some of the things that we did well early was like we did not try to over engineer things there was probably some opportunities to use like slightly more off the shelf CI, CD and bake in a little bit more testing early on that I think like might have slightly slowed us down but actually sped us up. This may be like one of the biggest takeaways from the whole thing was you should invest heavily in tests, uh, especially even early. Like yeah. don't go crazy, right? Like you can't be writing tests for ever. 
but you should have core tests that cover base cases and that like help your whatever it is that you're deploying. Founders and investors both make money and impact the world when they believe something nobody else believes yet, but are right. Another company Brett's invested in is a very ambitious one called Astroforge. They're literally doing mining for high value ore on asteroids. At no point was anyone really worried about the market opportunity. Um, you know, we're always balancing market risk with technical risk in, in the startups we fund. And there was just no question that if Astroforge can go to asteroids and mine rare earth elements and bring them back, you know, the, the only real risk in the market is that they do it so successfully that those metals are worth a lot less. And so really all we spent our time was in was validating, is this possible? And I think specifically, if it is in fact possible, why is it possible now suddenly? Why, why, did, why are we seeing this company today? Because uh, on some timeline, it seems like something that's well within the ability of humans to produce, but you need to have a view that it's going to be uh, it's going to happen in time for this company to make money off it. Jose Akane, co-founder of Astroforge, is trying to solve engineering problems on literally the edge of human capability. And the thing is, you don't have a manual for that. You've got to write the manual yourself. The gut reaction was, asteroid mining is difficult. The refinery yeah. is difficult. It this couldn't is be the cord. It couldn't be the cord. <laughs> it, couldn't be the, it couldn't be the simple pass-through. The length that we went through to solve this problem baffles me to this day. You're focusing on this problem that's difficult. Glazing over something so simple. And, and I talk about this fishbone diagram because these are things that you should really actually check. You should write down like, great, the grass support equipment, do we check everything in there? And not just say like, yeah, I checked the voltage, which is just one part of it. Um, and we just checked it off like, okay, cool. Power supply works, harness works, great. Even if you are under heavy time pressure, take a minute and pause, slow down. It's okay to do that and really assess the situation and really validate all these potential failures to get to that solution. That's just a taste of what you'll find in Brett's new podcast. I'm subscribing and I recommend that you do too. You know, the intent is less a technical deep dive and more about this, this, the, the story about the art of problem solving and what goes into day-to-day -day engineering in these technical domains and how it can be, you know, just interesting in its own right. You can find High Bit by Brett Gibson on anywhere you listen to podcasts or initialize.com slash High Bit. Link in the description below. Initialized is also hiring a new investment partner. You can't apply to jobs you don't know about, so that's why they're running an open hiring process for this role. Initialized is currently hiring a partner role, um, and you know we we really prize uh, backgrounds in founding and working in startups and ability to advise startups in in some area of of deep domain expertise. So. Uh, you know, at high level, I think we're, we're looking for someone who's, who's been a founder before, you know, hopefully gotten a company uh, through perhaps a Series B round. And, and, but also, it, it's very helpful if they have some investing experience, whether that's as an angel or, with, or as part of a, a, a venture firm. Um, you know, a big, a big part of the applied knowledge of, of going from founder to investor is just getting reps and, and seeing pitches. Being an investor, to me, is just an absolute blessing. And if you ever wanted to join a team doing it right, and you have some investment experience already, this is a big opportunity. That's it for this week. Brett's an old friend of mine, and I'm so excited to see where he takes Initialized Capital. Links in the description to apply to be an investor at Initialized and to subscribe to Brett's new podcast, High Bit. Technology is truly reshaping the world, and it's technologists, the engineers, the PMs, the designers, and the builders themselves, they're the ones doing it. If you watched to the end, you must believe this too. And I'm here to tell you, you're on the right track. I'll see you next time.